What's up, everybody? Welcome to another Redstone episode, where today we're going to be talking about introducing logic to your survival Redstone contraptions. Kind of like we did here on version 2 of my automatic smart factory. And before you get discouraged, don't worry. While there is quite a bit of intelligence in this smart factory, a lot of it is a copy and paste. We just had to figure out certain sections, then copy and paste. And I think the easiest way to go about this is to first go over what's happening here in the smart factory, but then we're gonna go through and we're kinda gonna break down all the separate little sections here and go over how each of them are helping the factory achieve its ultimate goal. Let's waste no time and hop right into it. So I think to start this off, the best thing to do is to talk about what we've achieved so far with version two here. So this version of the smart factory can craft up to 15 separate items. Uh, you can craft multiple items at a time if you want to. Um, each of the 15 individual crafting cells, these guys right here, uh, monitor and refill their own supplies so their individual ingredients that they have they monitor each of those and refill only those supplies and then also each of the 15 craft cells will automatically shut off their crafting cell if they can't be refilled now that's everything that we've achieved so far and it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I mean, I mean, just, but just look at, <laughs> look at everything that we've had to do just to achieve this so far. Now, that being said, we do have a couple systems in place that we're going to need in the future that we're not currently using. Like this right here, for example, we don't actually use this right now, but we have it in place so that when we do need it, it's ready to go. Uh, I think that the next best step is to kind of talk about from the beginning what is happening. So this is the selector panel. Obviously, there's a few different ways you could set this up. But what we're doing here is we're sending in specific signal strengths into this contraption based off button position. So obviously, when we press this button right here, we're getting a 15 signal strength right here. But by the time it reaches over here, it's only a one. So it sends a one signal strength into the into this system right here. So this is our selector panel. As long as you're achieving that whatever, you know, corresponding whatever is the correct signal strength that you're trying to activate for the farm, you could do whatever as far as your input goes. Um, as far as what we're inputting into, that is this absolute monstrosity right here. We're going to go ahead and step away from the factory for this one. And we're going to go check it out over there. So, what is this thing? Well, this is a red coder before I actually knew what a red coder was. See, when I first started one... When I first started figuring logic out and kind of getting into logic... I wanted to be able to isolate the a signal strength and I just wanted to be able to come up with something on my own before I actually started looking into stuff. And this is what I came up with. Like I said, it's basically just an overworked red coder. It, it's achieving the exact same thing that that is over there, just with a lot more stuff going on. Now, one thing that I will say is for what we're using it for in this very specific application, this is better than the red coder just because of how we're sending signals in different directions and whatnot. This is already set up to do that, where to do it on a normal red coder, we would from here have to set up you know, monostable circuits coming off of each side and whatnot, which we might do for version 3. I am thinking that using a normal red coder for version 3 is going to be the way to go. But we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Because we're doing more than just taking a red code signal off of this. We're doing more than just getting a signal strength and sending a signal appropriate to that out. We're also 
converting it into a binary signal. This was this is something that we're going to be using down the road. I want to have a LED display for the factory, giving off all sorts of information, stuff that we'll get into later on. And the easiest way to do that is through a binary signal, which is what this bottom part down here is doing. We can see if we select a number, one, two, three, four, five, we're gonna get five on our binary counter. At least I think that's five. Is that backwards? Hold on. I think that's backwards. That's backwards. <laughs> so that might actually be something I'll need to make sure is up there. But you can see kind of the idea. When we put in a signal, we're gonna get our binary signal out, which will then send into registers and memories and all that, da da. Stuff that I'm not even ready for yet. Okay, so we've talked about putting the signal in and what we're putting the signal into. Now, where is our overworked red coder sending the signal? Well, as you might be able to surmise, the appropriate button that you push activates that number for the auto crafting cell. I don't really wanna to go too crazy into what's happening here. We're gonna end up doing a tutorial on this for my next redstone video. But generally, I can show you that we are, I mean, automatically crafting. We have it set up so that hoppers are doing most of the timing for us. Um, everything gets fed into a dropper, which obviously when the dropper activates, it'll come down and we'll be able to craft everything according. Like I said, we're, we're gonna go over the auto crafting portion itself in the next video in a lot more depth. But as for now, we can see that we're sending a signal to activate the appropriate auto crafter okay what happens once we send the signal to the crafter well the crafter here like we were talking about earlier can sense the levels of the items that are in it based off whatever you're crafting and once it detects that it is out it sends a signal through this line right here which does a couple of things actually so this is firstly going to send a signal off that way saying that we need supplies. It's also going to be sending a signal up this way, which is going to change the water flow of the supply delivery. So let's say that this crafting cell activates. Well, it's going to send a signal saying that, hey, I need, you know, X amount or X supplies, send them over this way. Well, once over there detects that and starts sending them this way, it all comes through and it's gonna start going through this water stream here. Well, what we've done is since this is the cell that called for the supplies, this is the only cell that we want to receive the supplies. So that's where all this comes in. Once this activates, it's going to pick up the glass block and drop down the iron bar here, which is going to allow items to, instead of passing through, come through and start refilling the crafting center itself which is where this next circuit comes in this next circuit firstly took me literal weeks to figure out i couldn't even think of a way to describe what i needed to happen in a good enough way to search it so i literally just had to come up with this off of my dome piece and like i said it took me a hot minute but this circuit right here, this gray circuit right here, is doing two very important things as far as item delivery goes. So as you can imagine, like we said, you can have multiple factories going at the same time, right? Well, what happens when multiple factories need supplies at the same time? Well, if they all were able to send their signals through, we would just be sending loads of supplies that could be going into any of the open crafters and who you know some of these crafters might not get supplies because this one over here took all of the supplies and you know we just wanted to be able to avoid that so the very first thing that this circuit is doing actually let's head down there i've got i've got a thing down there let's head down there the first thing that this circuit is doing is taking inputs from the factories here you can see we have four inputs for four of the different factories. And it's going to take the input, and once it receives the, the, this 
uh, let's see if I get this right, that this RS Norlatch is sending a signal through. It's going to send its signal all the way through, which will activate the next portion of the circuit that we'll go to in a second. But it is also sending signal down the line, not that's blocking signal from being sent from any of these other lines. So let's say that we activate this one, right? We can see that the signal goes through, but then this one gets activated. Come on. And nothing's happening. Our RS Norlatch is sending something out. And now that the next circuit has taken over and ended that signal, now we're sending this signal through. So that's what this first part of it does, honestly. Just sitting here looking at this, I don't know that I could. I would have to sit here and actually stare at this for a hot minute to be able to explain what's actually going on here. But I know that the key thing that helped me was locking repeaters. Being able to do that and getting the timings and sequencings down for that. What is happening? Calm down. Uh, is really what made this first portion of the circuit possible which single-handedly is the reason that we are able to run multiple factories at a time up there. But moving on, we can see that once the signal comes through, it activates right here. What this part is doing, once the signal comes right here, this goes up to the actual waterway portion, the portion that, you know, send, has water either letting the items go into the crafting cell or moving on to the next one. That's what this signal does. It activates first. It opens up the crafting cell to be reloaded, which is what this ether hopper clock is handling. Then once this ether hopper ether once this ether hopper clock is activated, it is then sending a signal to this next ether hopper clock, which we have set up to actually activate the storage where all the supplies are to actually start sending the supplies to the factory. So what we have going on is this signal right here we have set to obviously last for much longer than this signal right here. So that once we activate this, it opens the channel before supplies even start getting to it or going through. Then once the supplies are going through, they'll be activated and it starts uh, dropper dumping just supplies like crazy. We'll go, we'll look at it here in a second. But uh, it starts dropper dumping supplies that start going through the water stream. Well, this will shut off and the supplies will still need time to be able to travel through the system and up to the crafting cell, which is why this right here stays on longer so that the supplies actually have time to go through the whole delivery system before the cell itself shuts. So now we've talked about the crafting cells and sending the signals for resupply, but what we haven't talked about is how the signal knows what to send to the cell. Well, this is where a bit of encoding comes into place. See, what you would do is since you have to set up each of the individual filters for the items based off whatever you're crafting, you would then come over to this portion and encode this line here to give you whatever supplies correlate to the storage right here. So say for example, this line comes from number seven. So number seven activates. Well, we would then have a torch wherever we needed to actually get supplies from. So if we needed this one, we'll say this one contains stone. So we need stone over there. So we have our torch here so that when this activates, the torch will turn on, which will do what it's doing now. We'll go ahead and do that real quick. So you can see that you would have this lined up so that whatever supplies you need, you have a torch on encoding your signal to give us the appropriate supplies. I will admit I'm not overly happy with this part of the system right now. That's one of the things we're going to look into for version three for changing is this part right here. I do think that the encoding is the way to go, but I just, I don't know. 
There's a lot of thought that's going to need to go into the delivery of all the items here. And really, that's about the bulk of what we have done so far. Uh, as far as the collection of crafted items, what we are going to do is have them spit into the powdered snow, which I just realized I'm going to have to change a couple things. Uh, but it'll drop into the powder snow and we'll have that go into a collection system, which I haven't decided if we're going to do shulker loaders yet or not. We'll kind of have to see how we decide to go from there. But we still need to set that up and then we need to finish setting up just putting in raw supplies. So all, everything for back there. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is just have it so that whatever side you need to resupply you'll just dump into the appropriate side and we're just going to have it feed into the already existing supply delivery just at the back end so that it'll dump in here and just go straight over to the resupply over there. Okay, so now that we've had some brief examples of how we can introduce logic into our survival redstone, let's kind of go into a little more depth about a couple of the components that we're using there and how you really could use them in so many different ways. So we'll start here with the red coder, which is like I said, what that is just a lot simpler. So what the red coder does here, as we can see, is whatever signal you're putting in, obviously is what it puts out. So we can use this for numerous things. One, like we're doing up there, selecting that we want certain things to activate. It's really about the main thing that you would use this for is being able to use something either like this or, you know, a container that you're slowly filling up or something along those lines. Basically, the red coder lets you take a comparator signal and output only what the strength itself is. So you can see that normally if we had this comparator going, we'd have all this redstone activated so that if the lamps were right here, all the lamps up until this point would be activated. The red coder itself allows you to isolate the signal that it is actually at. This guy right here, if we really had to classify it as anything, this would be a form of short-term memory. This is simply locking signals that are put in until the previous signal is done and then letting the next signal go through. I can think of a few different reasons you would want to use this, but I think something like this would be the main use of it, is you have something that has the potential to send a lot of signals in, but you only want one signal to actually go through at a time, then you would have to use something like this. I'm sure that at some point I'll buckle down and actually figure out refigure out what I've got going on here and try to simplify it a little bit more and at said point I'll probably end up doing a tutorial on this circuit because just the function of what this circuit can do I can see myself using a lot there are a lot of things that I would really enjoy being able to have a short-term memory of multiple signals but only one signal activating at a time this portion of stuff that we're seeing right here we haven't used up there yet, but we are going to. See, what I want is at the end of the day, once everything in the actual factory is figured out and once I'm happy with everything that we have going on up there, I want to set up a visual display of the factory. So there's, a, there's quite a few details that I need to work out, what information we actually want displayed, how we want everything displayed, but that is what we are going to use these things for, is being able to display all of our information over there. Uh, the, what we've got going on here, is these are just two different, what are known as pixel displays. So think of each one of these as a single pixel on a very large screen. This right here is just encoding, it's just stacked. And this is how we are actually going to activate the screen, obviously we'll set this up and have each one of these link up to a different pixel on our screen and then whenever this line is activated it'll display whatever we have it set up to display well guys i know that it is kind of a short fast-paced one or well a fast-paced one anyway 
But uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I've got quite a bit of work left to do on this guy. There's still so much that I want to work out and so much logic that I want to apply. I'm having so much fun implementing logic into just regular survival redstone contraptions. But if you guys have any ideas of how I could improve this or anything like that, let me know down in the comments. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you later.